You're now listening to the Adiel Gorel Show. Each episode, I'll bring you the latest news for my discussions with top health and wellness experts so that you can bring yourself into better health. Today on the Adiel Gorel Show. Um, the backup system is to consume things that are high in nitrate. One of my favorites is arugula, which I put into my smoothies. Um, that's NO3. And then to make sure that you have the right bacteria in your mouth that can convert NO3 to NO2. Because no human has the enzyme to do that conversion. And then when you swallow the NO2 in the hydrochloric acid, you make nitric oxide. And then there's some complex ways that the body captures it and delivers it where it needs to go. So, I here for. so we get on your we get on your website yes. johnsattery.com yes. to join your tribe and get that monthly update. Yeah. That's a great thing for us to know. What what about that specific lecture that you're talking yeah, about? Yeah, and that lecture so get... so not only do you get the live lectures, but I've captured my entire library for, you know, two plus years. So it's all there. Whether you want to talk about nitric oxide or how do you get rid of senescent cells or how do you improve your gut microbiome or what do you do to improve your sleep so every foundational thing that i'm doing is in there and it's captured so so the name the name of that lecture is it's, it's called specifically the name of it was something to the effect of a root cause of brain fog chronic inflammation and feeling toxic and then I went beyond that and talked about the Alzheimer's connection and the, the, the cardiovascular disease connection as well. So if they, if they sign up and then they look for that root cause of brain, fro- brain fog and chronic inflammation, it's right there. So there's a recording. It's all there. They can click on it and watch it or hit rewind if they miss something. Yeah. So. There was a lozenge that we talked about last time regarding nitric oxide yes. um, the neo 40 i don't the neo 40 yeah and uh, you you think that that's useful i do yeah yeah in fact um i uh i take that and i did a whole episode on nitric oxide and i showed people how i tested my levels after i showed them why it was important then i said okay here's my 28 day study and i started out near in the bottom part of the range and in 28 days, I pushed myself up to the top of the range. And I did multiple things. Because I always work on multiple mechanisms. You know, if you're building a race car, you can't just focus on horsepower. It's about tires. It's about suspension. It's fuel injection. It's the brake technology. You, you have to tune your body by going after multiple mechanisms. And uh, that's the biggest problem I have with most health books. I love the book, but they make it all about one thing, whether it's gluten or it's all about uric acid or it's all about this one thing. It's all about inflammation. And I say, you are absolutely right. That's a load-bearing wall in terms of your longevity, but it's not the only one. You could be perfect on inflammation, not get enough K2, calcify your arteries, and die of a heart attack um, because you've ruined your arteries. So it's never, the health is never one thing. It's always a whole range of things. And you know, Adiel, you and I have talked it. The key thing is you need to figure out where you are. Someone has to know, they have to see your biomarkers to know where you are to give you direction to help you get to where you want to be and you have to measure to see if it's working or not. Your GPS couldn't work without the satellites. So to me, your biomarkers are those GPS satellites. They tell us where you are. What are your weak links? What are your big issues? Then let's focus on those and then go back and measure those two or three biomarkers six months later. Did it work or not? If it didn't work, then you have to try something else. If it did work, and seeing in your blood chemistry that it worked, 
you're going to be motivated to keep doing it because you're like, oh my God, look at my, my, uh, you know, my A1C, my HbA1c just went down 0.3 points. You know, wow, this is great. I know, I, you know, now I'm a nerd. I have all my data plotted in 50 different graphs going back to 2008. And every time I try a supplement or make a change, I make note of that and I say, because some things will help these two items, but the, it may be problematic on a third. So I wanna basically monitor everything once a year and then go back and retest occasionally to see if something's working. And as part of my, um, my program, I give, people were like, Joe, can we have the spreadsheet? I said, sure. So they can download, once they, once they sign up, they can download the spreadsheet and they can drop their data in. And the reason is, if you have a file that's an inch thick of your blood work for the last 10 years, you look at it and it's hard to make sense of that one inch thick file. But when it's graphed, seeing data graphed makes it easy to see. Am I getting better, worse? Do I generally tend low on this? And now I'm going a little lower. You know, and, you, and the other part with blood work is the normal range is not the healthy range. So the, the normal range just says 95% of the people that took this test fall within these two limits. But you may be in part of the normal range that is dangerous as hell. So I teach people, you don't want to be in the normal range. You want to be in the good part of the normal range if when you're 60 or 70 or 80, you want to be young and vital. So. Okay, so now uh, going back into the details as I'm apt to do, the lozenge, the, you know, the 40, yes. uh, what the, the name. Um, I know it varies by person, but you're in your 60s. I'm in my 60s. Yes. Um, how many a day do you take? Um, I followed their instructions pretty precisely, which was for the first 30 days during a loading phase, I think I, I took one in the morning and one at night, so about 12 hours apart. And then um, after 30 days, I went down to taking um, you know, one a day. And then I have additional test strips, which you can buy on Amazon. They're pretty cheap. And then occasionally, you know, once every two weeks, I'll measure my levels, and uh, sometimes I measure my levels because I forgot to take the Neo 40 for a week or two, or I haven't been making my special smoothies, which also you know, give you a lot of the raw material to build nitric oxide. I mean, the biggest thing about nitric oxide is you make it in that endothelial layer in your arteries. That's the good news. The bad news is when you turn 50, your cells have lost, on average, half their ability to make it. That's really bad news. But then the positive side is there's a backup system that you can activate to make it, you know, to, to make more. And we can all turn that on. So that's, you know, that's how I think of it. What's the backup system? Um, the backup system is to consume things that are high in nitrate. One of my favorites is arugula, which I put into my smoothies. Um, that's NO3, and then to make sure that you have the right bacteria in your mouth that can convert NO3 to NO2, because no human has the enzyme to do that conversion. And then when you swallow the NO2 in the hydrochloric acid, you make nitric oxide, and then there's some complex ways that the body captures it and delivers it where it needs to go. The, the, now I'm going to go to yeah, a, a piece of information you talked about way, way before <clears throat> when we talked sure. <clears throat> on the PBS show Yes, uh, in 2019. I'm jumping all the way back to vitamin E. Yes. So, you know, again, I think I may have asked you this question before. I'm already taking the um, mixed life extension. Like the mixed natural tocopherols or the high gamma natural to cough So I'm yes. taking the life extension multi just a little bit. That's just, you know, a portion. But then yeah. f hearing you speak, I bought the one that has the gamma and I think, you know, a couple of, you know, the other the beneficial delta, ones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The delta. So do you take both? Do you, is it okay? Um, 
you know, I'm a nerd and I'm a researcher, so I don't take any multi. I build my own stack. Um, so, but a multi, you know, a good multi, a good one, and most of them are crap, but a good one, um, I think, can work for you. But I would, I would at least two days a week take the the one that's going to deliver a substantial amount of gamma tocopherol. And the reason is you can look at a, I believe it was a 2021 study out of Johns Hopkins. They looked at 10,000 men and the guys that had the highest blood levels of gamma tocopherol versus the guys in the bottom group. So they split them into five groups. You know, they didn't have 5% less prostate cancer. They had a five fold reduction in prostate cancer. Mm-hmm. And I said, boom, almost all men end up with prostate cancer. I want to die with my prostate unbiopsied, not removed. You know, I, I want to I block that. And there's a, there's a uh, particular fr- nitrogen free radical that is a nasty one, which appears to be involved in prostate cancer. And the gamma and the delta are, the, are two of the only molecules that can actually, actually quench that. But the alpha cannot. And so, um, and then, yeah, so I don't want to get us off. I have a study, I have a, a, a free video on YouTube that's called The Supplement Mistake That Millions of People Make Every Day. And I show how supplementing with synthetic alpha tocopherol actually boost your prostate cancer risk by 17%. And that's not me guessing. The U.S. government spent $114 million doing a study called the SELECT study, and uh, they proved that, that, that when they gave people supplemental synthetic vitamin E and only the alpha, and in table one of that study, because you know, it's still burned it in my brain, you can see that within six months of starting this protocol, their gamma tocopherol dropped in half. So it. What if it's not synthetic alpha? What is yeah, it the, not synthetic? If it says alpha, if it says D comma L, David comma Larry, that means it is a synthetic alpha tocopherol, um, and natural alpha tocopherol made by plants. All three of the optical carbons are all right-handed. There's, it's R, R, R. But when they make it in the lab, it's a blend of eight different molecules, and only one out of the eight works. And it still doesn't work for prostate cancer, but only one of the eight works. So I tell people, hey, here's your secret service team. Um, one guy is real. And the other seven guys are cardboard cutouts because not only does it not work, it takes up a place in the membrane, but it's sitting around and it doesn't do it for you. It doesn't work for yeah. you. So I don't want to walk out if I'm, you know, if I'm the president and have one real Secret Service guy and seven paper mache cutouts because I don't, you know, I want to be protected and I want to keep my prostate protected. So yeah. By the way, not to. <clears throat> not to mislead our viewers and listeners. Yes. My supplement regime is not a multi. Okay. <clears throat> I have my researcher slash nutritionist or maybe my personal John Sottery. Sure. Uh, build a stack that some of my friends, when they see it, say, oh my God, yeah. so many parts. Yeah. But to cover a couple of little things. Sure. If there's a portion of a multi that I take as well, just not to miss a couple of things. And in that more, in that little portion of a multi, which is by life extension, yes. they have the um, the E as well. And I I think it's not the synthetic one. Yeah, they're we they're talked about they're, it they're, they're pretty smart about their formulations, and I don't believe any of their formulas contain. Uh, it's I call it's racemic alpha tocopherol, and I call it the rat because it's right. it actually hurts you. It doesn't help you. 
but they they know that and they don't use that. So even in their multis, I believe they use a, a mixed natural tocopherol. Um, so one pet peeve that I have to share with you, John. Yes. I'm sure you experience it, you know, as well. Even if we talk about the Neo 40. So the Neo 40, you use it. Yeah. You know, I learned about it from you. I use it. Sure. But I understand they want to sell it. I understand it's a business. But yeah. why the heck is everything so incredibly sweet? Yeah, I would agree with you on that one. So normally I, when I take it, I would take it after my fast. I don't really want to break my fast with that. And I think you had that question for me. And, you know, you only have, in, you know, if your blood sugar is at 95, you know, you're fasting glucose, that's only like a, a teaspoon or a little more than a teaspoon of sugar in all your blood. So it doesn't take a lot of sugar to, you know, to break your fast. And so um, I don't, <coughs> I, and I think they might use some stevia too. Most people love sweet and, and I don't do a lot of sugar. So my <coughs> sense of taste in the old days when I had a little maple syrup, you know, it tasted kind of sweet. Now, if my kids are doing waffles and I just grab a little teaspoon and I take a half a teaspoon of maple syrup, it's like, boom. I mean, it, it, I get this massive reaction to it. And I believe that my, my tongue has created more sensors because it's not getting as much of the sweet sense. You know, it's a lot like with caffeine. Your first cup of coffee, you might be totally wired for a few days. But over time, you tend to gain some level of tolerance. And I think the same is true with sugar and sweetness. And when you remove that tolerance, it doesn't take much to just cause it to, you know, to go boom. Yeah, but just to express my pet peeve. Yes. There are many very beneficial compounds out there. These lozenges are one example. Good things. Everything is made to be horrifically sweet. So <laughs> hopefully, you know, I, my philosophy is this. I will pay a premium, Yes. at least me, I'll pay a premium to have a version that is absolutely unsweetened. If I want to sweeten it, I'll put honey, I'll put sugar, whatever I, I want to Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I agree. I mean, I think you should give them the feedback. I mean, smart company. I did. Oh, I did. Okay. I talked to them. Yeah, yeah. They said, sorry, it's marketing. Most people <laughs> like it sweet. <laughs> I hear you. I hear you. So that's, uh, that's a key thing. Um, you know, there's a couple other things that popped in my head, and I want to try to give people as much value as I can. So another thing that I've really spent a lot of time on the last year on was talking about sweeteners was fructose. And growing up and through most of my scientific career, I always thought of fructose as the healthy sugar. Fructose is delivered by fruit. It's a healthy sugar and so on. And... I then realized around, I don't know, 2014, that that's not the case. And now, uh, Dr. Richard Johnson um, uh, has done some great research. His research group has done some tremendous work. And what's happening to most Americans is that they're eating food that has a nutritional label on it. And those products the consumer products companies know that people want it sweet. And the least expensive way to sweeten something is to put in fructose, because fructose is the sweetest sugar. And so they don't put it in from pears or apples, they put it in from high fructose corn syrup, HF. Mm -hmm. you know, and that's about 55% fructose and 45% glucose. Most people are aware that high fructose corn syrup is a bad idea. I think that's starting to get into the consciousness. But what they don't realize is table sugar is half glucose and half fructose. It's a disaccharide. They just put together, and as soon as you eat it, the body starts splitting it into glucose and fructose. So I tell people table sugar is 90% as bad for you as high fructose corn syrup, and then stay away from agave syrup because I have friends that are like, oh, I don't use, this is my only sweetener. Agave syrup should be named super high fructose agave syrup because it's way higher 
than high fructose corn syrup. It's like, it's, it, it's a disaster. So in a nutshell, when you get a big wave of fructose from processed foods, and it's everywhere, when that hits your liver, only the, the liver metabolizes most, nearly all of the fructose. When it hits your liver, it wipes out your ATP. You're like, well, how, how could it do that? Well, fructose, when you metabolize it, it needs a phosphate. So you need to grab a phosphate off of ATP, and there's an enzyme called fructokinase, and it makes fructose 1-phosphate, of course. Yeah, yeah. All right. I'll, I'll stop talking gibberish. Um, but it wipes out the ATP levels in your liver, which is incredibly dangerous. Then the fructose, as it's metabolized, is turned into fat. So your liver starts getting loaded up with fat, and you could possibly get fatty liver disease, which is a, which is a nightmare. It used to be only people that were alcoholics had fatty liver disease, but now we have something called NAFLD, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, and that's rampant. So your liver starts filling up with fat, the liver dumps the fat in your bloodstream so your triglycerides start to skyrocket. And then worst of all, and I built, I, I grabbed my little model. You know, I always build stuff to help people get their mind around it. Sorry, it's the wrong color, so it kind of goes on the green screen. But that, this is my ATP. When you pull off a phosphate, you make ADP, adenosine diphosphate. And then... If you keep pulling phosphates, some of that, two of the ADPs get together and, and one of them steals a phosphate and you end up with something called AMP, adenosine monophosphate. That is your lithium, you know, you have your lithium batteries in your cell. A ATP is a fully charged version. ADP is the one that has been discharged. But when it goes to AMP, now, your body says, oh my God, we have to break this down. It breaks it down into uric acid. And uric acid causes gout, but it causes this incredible range of metabolic nightmares, elevated uric acid. So Dr. Johnson has written a book called Nature Wants You to Be Fat. Great book. Uh, you know, I've listened to it on Audible a couple times lays out the studies, lays out the research, great book. And then Dr. David Perlmutter, who's a physician that I followed for 25 years, really a leading edge guy, science driven. Um, in fact, he and I have done some clubhouse rooms together. Um, we had a chance to talk a little bit. Um, but he wrote a book called Drop Acid, which has nothing to do with Dra Grateful Dead concerts. It's about how do you drop your uric acid. And that's an excellent book as well. So. You know, you could pick, look at both of those and pick one of the two. Ideally, you read them both. But if you read that and you don't start to bring down your fructose, and, and to me, that's one of the two things in processed food that kills us. And that's what's killing a lot of Americans. So I don't want to wipe out the ATP in my liver. I don't want to make belly fat because fructose puts the fat around your midsection, you know, the visceral fat, I don't want type 2 diabetes. I don't want insulin resistance, but fructose drives that. I don't want NAFLD, the non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And uric acid pumps up your blood pressure. So if you fix your uric acid, you may be able to reduce the dose of your blood pressure medication or maybe eliminate it. So um, you know, I, I just say, if you're interested, dig into you know, Dr. Rich. Dr. Richard Johnson and Dr. David Perlmutter's books because they do a great job. I also, in my membership, I give you my take on it, the science, the metabolism, and then what am I doing about it? Um, you know, I, that's another episode. I don't remember what I, what I called it, but uh, that's also a really good episode. And, uh, so, John, yes. let me ask you this. Yeah. Um, I talked to some people who are very health conscious, very much following everything we're talking about yes. here. And they say, I'm a little bit confused on a couple of fronts. I read that 
manuka honey is very beneficial. Okay. And I use it a little bit in my tea or in my coffee. Yeah. Also, I'm using pure, unsugared, uh, 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 tart cherry that's dried. And, uh, but all of those things, John, have a lot of sweetness to them. Yeah. And so, they start on the chain of addiction to the sweetness. Yeah, so want it, you know, the next day. Here's the trick. If you keep your daily fructose consumption below on average about 25 grams a day, then the liver uses it to make glycogen, to rebuild your glycogen stores in the liver. And, and glycogen is just how you take glucose and connect them all together, and that's how your liver stores a little bit of glucose so when you're fasting, you know, it can maintain your blood sugar. So up to 25 grams, your liver can handle it. You don't want the big waves to come in. And um, the other thing which is fascinating, which I thought was fascinating, is even if you consume zero fructose, if you have a whole bunch of carbohydrate and glucose, your body can convert glucose into fructose. And um, I always think of the Paul Simon song, you know, you can call me Al, because the first enzyme, the rate limiting step, is an enzyme called aldose reductase. And Paul Simon's like, <laughs> why am I so round in the middle, you know, round in the middle? And it's about, you can call me Al. So I call aldose reductase Al. And you want to bring down the activity of that enzyme. And I'll, it's just another little simple thing. But so, you know, as a nerd, I dug into the science, I read the review articles, and I was like, what natural molecules that are known to have health benefits are good aldose reductase inhibitors? And beautifully, quercetin at 14 nanomoles shuts that enzyme down by half. And we know that quercetin helps with, as a zinc transporter, and it seems to have benefits with COVID by inhibiting the same enzyme that Paxlovid targets. Um, so um, I will continue to take quercetin, and it's beautiful because that's 14.3 billionths, you know, of a, of a mole, a molar in your blood. So it's not hard to achieve. So, and I believe- How much do you take? Um, if you take just quercetin, most people would suggest, and you know, again, you have to look into it yourself, but most people would suggest that you take 500 milligrams of just quercetin. But there are other formulas where they formulate it into a phospholipid delivery system where you can take substantially less quercetin and, and achieve the same blood levels. So um, I take about 250 of the straight quercetin, and then I take another 18 or 20 milligrams um, you know, in the phospholipid formula. You know, and I'm probably just trying to cover all my bases. But uh, I, never, you know, I never realized you know, the body converts glucose into sorbitol and then sorbitol into fructose. But the rate-limiting enzyme is that aldose reductase. Let's bring down al and stop building fructose. Um, so, but up to 25 John, grams a day, I, you should be <clears throat> fine. It's not a poison. It's a picture a pot on the stove, Adiel. It's a small little pot. It can only hold 25 grams of fructose. And you're boiling it, and everything's fine. When you dump in 75 or 100 grams, it spills into these other pathways, and it ravages your kitchen like it ravages your metabolism. So you can't deal with these big waves of fructose coming through your liver because it's like you know, Mr. T and Rocky Three you know, punching your liver over and over again. And, you know, if your liver's not healthy, your skin's not going to look good. You're not going to feel good because your liver is cleaning your blood. It's metabolizing drugs. It's getting rid of toxins and you need it to work beautifully. So don't, you know, be nice to your liver if you want to stay around on this planet. So, yeah. What about stuff to support the liver, like silymarine and all of those things? I, I like that. So yeah, milk thistle, it's a plant, and it's high in that compound. Um, I, I generally take that once a day, 
and I think it's very healthy for your liver. And I think you know that's something that's been used for 40, 50 years, probably a lot more than that that I'm not aware of. So you know, if you go back to scientific articles from Switzerland in the 70s, I'm sure you're going to find a lot of articles on milk thistle. So I'm, I'm a believer, and I, I take it. So, yeah. I know that you don't have a lot of time, but I want to go back to the very beginning. Yes. Is there any way to minimize the entry, you know, of LPS, I mean, the, the, the quantity of, you know, LPS by minimizing somehow the entry of those gram-negative bacteria that will shed that stuff? Is there anything to do about that? Or we can do nothing about it? I that? would say that um, <clears throat> some relatively harmless bacteria have LPS on their membrane. And in fact, some of that LPS on those harmless bacteria were the ones that were implicated in that um, LSU article um, that, ju that just came out. So I don't think you're always going to have LPS in your gut. The trick is, and I, I grabbed one of my little, uh, my little helpers. I don't know if you can see this or not, but uh, let me see if I... So what the trick is, you know, here's your gut. And here, you know, you have just one layer of cells between your gut and your bloodstream. And you need to keep these tight junctions tight. You need to bring down inflammation. And if you have junctions that are broken, how do they make energy to fix that? They need butyrate. So butyrate is the magic fuel for your gut. How do you get butyrate? You put in good soluble fibers. The bugs metabolize them. They love them. They flourish. And they make butyrate for your gut cells. So it's kind of a, a symbiotic relationship there. So it's always going to be in your gut. I would just say keep the LPS in your poop. Keep it out of your blood. You know, that's, uh, it's about gut barrier function. And there are some tests where you can consume sh certain sugars, and then they will look in your urine to see um, if they're crossing or not. And if you have an intact gut, the sugars that are not supposed to cross don't show up in your urine sample. But if you have a permeable gut, you will see significant amounts of those non-absorbable sugars. You know, your liver will be like, okay, and your kidneys will be like, okay, we have to metabolize and excrete this stuff. So if you suspect you have a leaky gut or you have gut permeability, it might be interesting to do that test and see. Um, I actually was at a wedding 10 years ago and I met a couple, we were having breakfast, they were at the wedding as well, and we were at the same B&B, &B and we had breakfast, and we talked for like three hours over breakfast, and they were picking my brain, what about this, what about this, what about this, and we had a great time, and then they said, what about leaky gut, John, and they go, that just sounds so hokey to me, and I go, I go, there's like 6,000 articles on PubMed, I go, just go to PubMed and put in intestinal permeability, and they were like, oh my God, I, we thought all of our patients were just a little bit uh, out there when they were telling us that. They go, that's real? And I said, yeah, when it, when it gets inflamed and those junctions open up, things cross over that shouldn't. And it's not just LPS. It's you know, broken down protein components. That the, again, the immune system sees those and says, kill this thing. And if that pattern, that, pep, you know, that peptide that comes across has the same sequence as your thyroid, your immune system may start attacking your thyroid and you may end up with Hashimoto's. If it starts attacking the beta cells in your pancreas, you may destroy the cells that, need to, that produce insulin and you may end up damaging your pancreas. Or you, know, you could end up with lupus or you could end up with all these different autoimmune diseases. And I think that gut permeability, it's not the only cause but that's one of the things that's really been driving that. And if you fix your gut, a lot of those things um, become a lot less problematic. So. John, obviously, we could talk for six hours easily. I know that your time is limited. I want to be, yeah. I want to, uh, you know, express my deep gratitude that you took the time to come here and be with us. And I'm asking you to do it again because it's always so fascinating and we learn something new each and every time. Sure. I want to thank you so much, John, for being with and us. And I have one bonus item for people 
that I was excited about, but we, you know, we went a little deeper on the other ones, and that is Google NRF2. NRF2 stands for Nuclear Regulatory Factor 2 because that, that is your laser-based air defense system to knock out free radicals and to get rid of carcinogens. Um, and that's why broccoli sprouts are so healthy because they produce a molecule called sulforaphane, which turns up NRF2. And then your body, the cells produce the, the superoxide dismutase, the catalase, all these enzymes that can kill billions of free radicals per second. Whereas vitamin C or vitamin E those are Patriot missiles. One vitamin C takes out one free radical, but one superoxide dismutase enzyme can kill eight billion every single second. And it lasts, when you activate it, it lasts for two or three days. So do a Google search on NRF2, Nuclear Regulatory Factor 2, because everybody should be looking to, and I have some, I, I did a whole nother talk on this. Um, I, I teach people, here's why it's important, and then I show them my tools and tricks to really bring it up, because I eat broccoli, but it's normally steamed. And if you don't do the trick, you really get almost no sulforaphane from the broccoli. But there's a trick, and it's, I don't wanna hold back, it's buy some mustard seeds from Amazon, and when you eat steamed broccoli, take a half a teaspoon of those mustard seeds and crunch them up in your mouth because that will give you the myrosinase enzyme that you need to produce the sulforaphane, which will turn on your laser-based air defense systems. So I would say eat broccoli twice a week, but chew up some mustard seeds with it. You can also eat raw broccoli and you can eat broccoli sprouts, but those are generally not sustainable for a lot of people because they just don't like the taste. And part of the taste is the sulforaphane. <laughs> so it's, you know, if, you, if, it's, if you're getting sulforaphane, it probably gives you a taste that you don't like. So, cool. Um, you know, and I always enjoy our conversations. And uh, um, yeah, I hope we didn't go too deep. But I hate when people tell me, do this and do this and do this. I need to know why it's important. And I need to know that there's some good science that underpins what they're telling me. It's not just repeating what they've heard from someone else. Because health is a big echo chamber. And a lot of those echoes are wrong or misguided. And some of them are self-serving because people are creating echoes on things where they make a lot of money. I'm not in the supplement business. I don't have any deals with anybody if I tell somebody I'm taking something, it's because I'm taking it. I don't, you know, I don't feel like you can be credible or com you can be as credible if at the end of every one of your videos, you tell people, buy this, and here's my link for it. Because when people have, um, when they're part of the transaction, then they're no longer your independent, <clears throat> you know, third-party person, so. Great, great to see you, and it was, it was fun. It was, it was always fun. So thank you. Always a pleasure, John. Have a wonder. I hope you know your holidays are great and fun. Thank you for you and your family, and thanks for coming on the show. And I'm looking forward to seeing you again soon. Great, and uh, keep you guys drink that half gallon of water every day. I need to, I need to <coughs> get a little bit of mind now because my, <coughs> I ran out during the talk. So thank you, Adiel, and uh, wish you the best of health. And I hope you have a beautiful holiday as well. So take care, my friend. Same to you, John. Yeah. Take okay. care. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you for joining me today for the second part of our amazing interview. If you didn't catch part one, don't miss out. The link is in the description below for you. And be sure to click the subscribe button for more videos.